Hello and welcome to episode 151 of the How to Survive podcast. My name is Joe. Joining me as ever, Chris. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good day. Uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, you too. Chuck another shrimp on the barbie. Because <laughs> this week, it's cargo. I come from the land down under where wind blow and men plunder. Yeah. Do you hear? Do you hear the thunder? Do you, do you know I can do a quite good impression of a didgeridoo? Come. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten how to do it. <laughs> well, that's how you play one. Now I remember. <laughs> what? You mean you play one? What is this? You play, like, that, 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 just to, for anyone who's listening at home. <laughs> like that, don't it? Do you know? What's the film this week, Joe? <laughs> What does a mechanic do? Makes car go. Great. That's the movie this week. Yeah. Car go. Great. 2017's Car Go, released this year by Netflix around the world. Yep. Directed by Yolandi Ramke and Ben Howling, who also wrote the film. Mm -hmm. We're going to discuss the film at some considerable length. Mm. Exhaustive length, yeah. some would say. <laughs> Approach it from all angles. Yeah. And... Um, and we're going to spoil it in that discussion. So mm. if you haven't seen Cargo, now's your last chance to duck out, find it on Netflix before you listen and have it spoiled even more. Yeah. And, and gain insights on how to survive in it, which yeah. is what we do later on. Uh, this, uh, this week's film was suggested by a listener. You can request films for mm. us to cover. This was requested by Deborah on okay. Twitter. Cheers, Deborah. Uh, at How to Survive Pod, if you want to tweet any suggestions to us. How to survive show at gmail.com is the email address should you want to unrestrict your correspondence. By a character limit, you mean? Yes. Right. I thought you meant you put a block on like everyone except Debbie to, <laughs> to get in touch. Deborah. Deborah, sorry. So without further ado, here's a trailer and we'll, uh, we'll pick up afterwards. Mm. This country changing. Sick. We all get sick. You get sick too. If you are infected, then you've got 48 hours. Stop the car! We, we need to, Let me we out! Need to... You have to take her. What do you mean? You have to what take her. I'm here, all right? So, Chris, Cargo. Quick plot recap for those who haven't seen it for a while or haven't seen it ever and mm -hmm. still want to listen anyway. Andy and Kay have survived a plague that has wiped out most of humanity. Aboard an old boat, they sail around the Australian outback looking for shelter, food and protection for themselves and their baby daughter, Rosie. They happen upon a capsized yacht, which Andy boards alone. He finds enough tinned food for three months as well as a bottle of wine which he gives to Kay as an anniversary present. He assures Kay that there was no real danger in him boarding the yacht alone, and goes for a nap. Kay now boards the yacht alone to find a gift for Andy, but is attacked by an infected person lurking in the depths. Uh, it should be mentioned that if you become infected by this particular disease, you turn into something like a zombie, although it's more on the 28 Days Later side of zombiehood, where... It's not hordes of them. It's more like you're an infected person just trying to bite people. Yeah, they're not running, though, are they? No. They're sort of stumbling. But also, I don't think that they're dead. No, they change. Yeah, they're, it's like, they're it's, irreparably changed. It might be better to say they, they appear to have some sort of parasite, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. A tracking device indicates that Kay has, at best, 48 hours to live. But Andy points out that she'll die sooner without medical attention for her wound. Mm. Uh, they wear like kind of like Fitbits with countdowns on them. It's, it's not really much a tracker; it's a timer. Yeah, it's it comes from a sort of government issue, like infection pack. Yeah, which uh, among other things has a spring loaded, like six inch syringe. Yeah, to kill people with yeah. to to kill, cleanly kill, uh, euthanize. euthanize people essentially it's like putting a coffin nail through your temple yeah. at high speed yeah and it also comes with like plastic handcuffs to tie 
infected people's hands mm-hmm. and a mouth guard to stop them biting. Yeah. Which that is a little detail that I really loved about the film actually. The, yeah. the anti-biting one. No, just the, the, the pack in yeah, general. I think that was good. It mm. shows a bit of uh, forethought. It's not just yeah. a brainless disease. So back on the boat, Andy and Kay make land and begin driving inland to a hospital. They swerve to avoid a wandering infected person and crash into a tree. They're knocked unconscious, but when they awake, Kay has turned into a zombie and bites Andy, who then kills her in return using one of those spring-loaded nail gun things. Now on his own 48-hour countdown, Andy must find a suitable carer for Rosie. Mm. And I typed that. Uh, he kept trying to correct it to career. So, <laughs> <laughs> Find yeah. a suitable career for yeah. Rosie. Who is eight months old. Yeah. He heads to the hospital as planned, but finds it derelict and largely abandoned. A kind woman helps, but she is elderly and terminally ill, so advises him to take Rosie to the Aboriginal people who have moved to safety in the mountains. He travels some more and happens upon Vic, a gas engineer who has become trapped under some canisters. Andy frees him and they drive to Vic's home where he lives with his wife, Lorraine. Andy and Vic go ranging and Andy leaves Lorraine in charge of Rosie along with a bottle of Kay's perfume, which he says seems to soothe Rosie. Vic reveals several cages where he has tied up Aboriginal people as bait to lure in infected people for him to pick off with a rifle. Uh, He does this so that he can basically steal their wedding rings, watches, wallets, things like that. Mm. Convinced that the world is going to correct itself and he will be wealthy. Yeah, he'll be like a tradesman in gas and jewellery. Yeah, I guess so. Um, The bait in question are Toomey, a young girl who we saw earlier on in the movie fending for herself. And in fact, it was her father who wandered out in the road and caused the accident that killed Kay. Yeah. Um, And someone called The Clever Man who a flashback reveals to be the kind of tribal leader or elder or a medicine man of some kind. Andy is appalled by the setup, but is on a short time frame and decides that at least Rosie will be well protected here. Mm. As he prepares to shoot himself in the head with the needle, Lorraine stops him and she begs him to help her and Rosie escape, explaining that Vic isn't her husband after all, but he is a chef who worked at the gas plant and trapped all the staff in the plant to die before making off with her. Mm. Nice guy. I think it's more of a, like, he left them to die as he was escaping, as a, as, instead of a sort of, you know... No, I think he locked the door. That was the impression I got. Okay. But he made sure they'd die, sort of thing. Right. I don't know why. Who's He's not buy a nice man. No. Who's going to buy all of his stolen wedding rings if they're all trapped in a plant? Yeah. Andy agrees to help her escape, but Vic emerges from the shadows and knocks Andy unconscious. When he awakes, he's in the same cage as Toomey, They work together to escape and head to Vic's home. They take Rosie, Lorraine, a rifle and the keys to the clever man's cage. Mm -hmm. But Vic wakes up. He tries to shoot at Andy, but Lorraine jumps in the way and is killed on the spot. Mm. Andy and Toomey escape with Rosie. They find the clever man's cage empty and head to the river. Heading back along the river, they find the home of a family that Andy saw at the beginning of the film. He was kind of warded off by the father waving a gun at him. Yeah. The family have been infected, uh, at least the father, maybe more. um, And the father has decided to kill them all with a revolver he's carrying, uh, which he does, but leaves two bullets for Andy. Uh, And he's kind of dug a big like mass grave for his family. Yeah, it's it's grim. Yeah, he doesn't use it though. All that digging for nothing. Well, he might have done. Mm, He might have put them in there and then... Yeah. Because you're about to say he walks off and shoots himself after shooting the rest of them. Andy takes the gun and Toomey says she'll take him and Rosie to her family who are just beyond a mountain. Mm. They travel through a tunnel in the mountain but Vic blocks the path ahead on the other side. They fight and Andy and Vic shoot each other uh, using the two remaining bullets. Mm. Realising the game is up, Vic hands Rosie to Andy and is left to die. Andy succumbs to his wounds and turns into a walking infected person. He uses a piece of meat on the end of a branch as a kind of carrot and stick method, and Toomey and Rosie ride him into Toomey's camp. Yeah. The clever man prepares to put Andy out of his misery, but Toomey first sprays Kay's perfume in the air, and Andy seems momentarily calm. And then the clever man finishes the job. In a valley, Toomey's family are shown to live happily and harmoniously, and Rosie is welcomed and doted on. 
Mm. There's like a sort of ersatz community that's been set up, um, you know, within this sort of like amazing like geographical bowl. Yeah, it's like a crater on top of a volcano or something. Yeah, but it's yeah. just like a it's almost like a Garden of need. Eden sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, and is it like people of all shapes and sizes of all ages mm. are just gathered around um, with babies? And yeah. it's a very nice, yeah, happy ending to an otherwise quite miserable film. Mm. So what did you think of Cargo, Chris? Um, I thought it was really quite good. Um, certainly within the, the, the spectrum of Netflix uh, releases. Yes. Um, you know, I thought it was, especially in the first act, I found it quite powerfully affecting, especially when Andy and his wife mm. are like trying to both come to terms with what has happened in yeah. that she's been bitten and also like find somewhere to you know somewhere that where Rosie is going to be safe yeah 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 and it's just it's basically like putting you in the position of being in the worst possible scenario yeah like if you've got loved ones because I, I remember you you made I mean you saw the film before me yeah. And you said you were very affected by the kind of opening 15 minutes or so. Yeah. I was less less affected by that, more affected by the ending. But what, what okay. was it about that that you got you? I think it's just like, it's so bleak and so upsetting. Like the, you sort of get the impression that a lot of people, were it not for ch- children, mm. would just kill themselves. Or, you know, in this world, that is probably what they have done. In fact, yeah. the people that you see are you know aside from andy and and his wife and the child you see the family who have children yeah. and therefore you know they're looking after the children you've got the terminally ill woman mm. you've got vic who has like his own ideas about what he's going to do post apocalypse yeah, yeah um <clears throat> and then you've got the aboriginal community who have each other yeah but it's sort of like it's so oppressively bleak yes for the first you know half of the film that it really is like I, I just found it quite like upsetting especially in the scenes when especially in the scenes where Kay is fitting and vomiting and obviously dying yeah and the I the the profound levels of stress you would be facing dealing with your wife going through that yeah. with like a literal countdown to when she's going to be dead yeah while also trying to you know save your daughter save your daughter and also like keep her al- you know like you don't you don't want her to die you don't yeah. want her to die yeah, yeah. and it's there, there are it you know it pulls on the heartstrings i think especially in the ending mm. uh with the perfume being sprayed yes that's that's a very like it's a gut Im- punch isn't it yeah it is and it um i i'm sort of Part of me thinks it's quite cheesy, but mm. I did find it quite effective. No, I, d- I, found, I found the ending very affecting. I yeah. don't know if it was earned necessarily. It's um, because, I mean, his wife dying is obviously, uh, yeah, he's upset. Yeah. And he becomes like, his sole mission is to save the baby. But it's not as if like throughout the film, he's like, oh, I, I can't go on without my wife. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then it, I think it, I think it's almost like the, the countdown and everything gives him a clarity of purpose that he otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. So it is like he doesn't, he can't... He doesn't have a choice. He can't feel sorry for himself because yeah. otherwise his, if he does that, his daughter would die. Yeah. The, the, I actually, I was quite impressed with Martin Freeman in this film mm. because he, um, it's, a, it's quite a non-standard zombie film protagonist in the sense that he's, he's basically like a comfortable urban dad yeah. who has been put in this situation that he's completely incapable of dealing, of dealing yeah. with. He doesn't even really have that much of a bond with his daughter, it feels like, at the start of the film. No, exactly. And the, the um, th- there are moments where the obvious stress and frustration of the situation he's in, like, leak out, mm. and he just, like... he he. There's one moment in particular when... I think he's arguing with Kay mm. because she's been bitten. And he's saying like, well, you know, there's loads of stuff in the water. It could have been anything. It could have been anything. Yeah. 
like you know obviously in denial yeah, yeah. and she says it had hands it had fingers yeah, yeah. and he goes fuck yeah like but it doesn't come i don't know whether it's martin freeman's performance or just like the the sort of how awful the situation is but mm. to me at least it didn't come across as sort of cheesy as you might expect from you know it being on the page you know yeah. and he screams like, oh, fuck. fuck yeah, yeah. Like, and you can imagine with a different actor, and dare I say it, an American actor, yeah. rather than a British actor, it may have come across as insincere. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to get someone to be, like, undercurrent of, like, seething emotion, yeah. but played down, you, you want Martin Freeman. I mean, that's it. that was his character in The Office as well. Yeah. Just, like, obviously raging inside, right? Yeah. To um, both, both male leads or, you know male romantic leads of the UK and American office have been in uh, post-apocalyptic horror movies this year. about saving their family this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought I thought Martin Freeman was excellent. I, there's, apparently he ha- his acting style is that he... Um, et, like, doing the same thing in two different takes is total anathema to him. He, no. he refuses to do it, basically. So every single take, he will play it differently really and i think that um the naturalism that he conveys with his character owes a lot to that it makes sense yeah because he's not he's not rehearsing he's just like he's performing it, it. yeah it's, it's yeah. more like he i guess maybe to him it feels more like he's in the moment and he's yeah just yeah he's reacting rather than acting is reacting chris yeah. right um yeah I what mean, did you what did you think of that? yeah it was very very good like you said i think it's a high high seven out of ten isn't it I don't think it's quite a... I wouldn't advise everyone in, in my like family to rush out and see it immediately, like I did with like, Hereditary or something. But it is very good. It, mostly, I'd say, a bit predictable. Like There's nothing in it where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a genre piece, really, yeah, isn't it? it but is, it's, yeah. it's like an interesting exploration of those. Yes. I thought the Australian outback setting lent it a scale that it probably wouldn't have got in other places. Like, yeah. This wouldn't have worked so well in a you know, urban environment because it needs the, like the time between zombie sightings to be mm. a bit more spaced out, I think. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, the novelty factor of that mm. can't be undersold. I don't think like yeah. it's, it's a, makes a drastic difference. Yeah. It's an impressive environment yeah. as much as like the situation itself is. Yeah. Not dissimilar to the one we find ourselves in. It's a 30 degree day. Yeah, we've managed to find the only place hotter than the Australian Outback yeah. to record this podcast. Yeah. So sorry if you can hear some fans in the background, but we would like genuinely die yeah. if it wasn't for them. And the fans are on low because otherwise it would ruin the audio. Otherwise it would just be like... <sighs> <sighs> yes. I mean, talking about it is making me wish we had it on. Yeah. Anyway, Martin Freeman resigns himself to the tragedy of the situation in a very admirable way, I think. Um, yeah. I don't mean him necessarily, but the character is like, like you said before, he becomes solely focused on that mission. Yeah. And that is, he doesn't lose his head, do you know what I mean? Mm. Even though you can tell he's like, obviously falling apart because yeah. he, his whole life is ruined. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's um, he'd found a comfortable existence on that boat. Yeah. And now he's not so happy. Yeah. Uh, aside from all zombie movies ever, I think it has elements of The Road in it. Did you mm-hmm. get that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, of Mad Max to an extent, maybe just the Australian just setting. Just the fact that it's in Australia. Yeah. Uh, 28 Days Later, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Which isn't quite a zombie film, but it's more about the, the disease. Yeah. Uh, I did get a lot of Children of Men in it as well. Mm. I think like Children of Men and 28 Days Later, this is a film as much about how people take advantage of the situation. Um, you know, the survivors take yeah. advantage of the situation. And obviously Vic is a... Heavy-handed arch- version of Yeah, it, yeah. it's an archetypal character for these sorts of films, yes. isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd say the zombies, though, aren't really the horror, if you know what I mean. Like, in the same way as Contagion, right? The, the disease itself isn't the horror. Yeah. It's... The horror is the idea of dying before you can see your children grow up or or losing your support, security and role model if you're to me. 
Yeah. Or losing the one person you felt loved you and your hopes and dreams for the future if you're Lorraine. Yeah. And you've got to now marry a, like, murderous... Psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a um, sort of unrelentingly bleak film until yeah. the last minute. Yeah. Even that's pretty bleak in the grand scheme of things. Uh, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. But, I mean... I, that is obviously offering it's, it's a looking glimmer towards of hope, the, isn't it? Yeah, looking towards the warmth of the sun. The zombies are basically a way of like making it possible for the disease to walk around. Yeah. They're probably the least interesting part of the movie, I think. Especially when you try to think too much about all the different symptoms. Mm. Like incubation times, like how do they know it's 48 hours? That, why does that change when you're bleeding? Or what happens to the blood and stuff? But that's largely okay if you approach it with a kind of walking dead mentality, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I thought it was quite... Um, it, it was just different enough, right? So, like, it wasn't so different that you felt like you needed the rules of everything to be explained to you. Mm. Um, but also it was different enough in terms of its design. You know, you have this sort of, like, pretty horrific pus yeah. and stuff that it's develops. Kind of like tree sap that yeah, comes yeah. out your eyes. Um, yeah, and your mouth and sort of mm. seals it up. And also the the motif of the infected sort of trying to dig. Bury their heads. Yeah, bury mm. their heads in the sand. And then it's a sort of, I mean, like, I wonder if the tree sap and, you know, burying your head in the sand is a sort of environmental mm. uh, message, allegorical yeah. motif type thing. Uh, especially considering, like, the you know, the people who survive... And help foster this new yeah. community of people who have been living off the land. Yeah. Well, a character called the Clever Man does yeah. say at some point, "Oh, it's because they've destroyed the environment." Well, it's, no, it's, it's it's not quite as heavy-handed as that. It's no. like it's because they're they've brought sickness. Like right. they they are, or it's something like that, isn't it? It's more. Yeah, yeah. It's just mm. allegorical enough to get away with it. Yeah. And and likewise, it's not quite sort of an anti uh colonial sentiment either like it's not saying you know like mother nature is taking revenge and it favors the natives no it's not quite as heavy and direct as that but that you can definitely read that sort of stuff into it I think. yeah exactly yeah. but then again I, I i would imagine any film that has sort of like Native Americans or Aboriginal people or, or similar has to have that reading. Yeah, yeah, or you know, you you're going to be able to find that. Yeah, it would be quite hard to get a reading in this film of like capitalism is good, greed is good. Right. Yeah. So, Chris, we often talk about preppers in movies like this. So mm. people who prepare for the worst, uh, stockpile tins of tuna and machine guns, things like that. But this movie seems to suggest that maybe they they and people like them are overthinking it. Do you think that? Uh, go on, show you're working. Well, you don't need to stockpile everything if you know how to live off the land, right? The, right, the aboriginals, like the Aboriginals. Exactly, yeah. They live in a, a Garden of Eden, picking fruit from the trees, hunting the animals they want to eat, things like that. But can you name me one prepper in a movie who made it out alive? Um, no, but then that's usually because the prepper characters are seen to be sort of maniacal over paranoid yeah and yeah. invariably they start off as oh they're a bit wacky and paranoid and then it develops into oh no they're genuinely mental yeah like yeah um unfit for survival well you've got um vic in this movie he's obviously yeah. well you got with the, the what i'm thinking of is sort of tim robbins character in um yeah. ogilvy uh of course Right, the uh, from War of the Worlds, yes, uh, or Howard in Ten Cloverfield Lane. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Howard didn't and didn't end well for him. No, Vic there, in this movie. There is one um, who doesn't quite fit that stereotype, but then maybe that's because the whole film is from that character's perspective. There's a film called Take Shelter. Okay, yeah, which uh, stars Michael Shannon. Yep, and I think it's directed by. The director who went on to make Midnight Special. That's correct, yeah. Uh, and it's a very good film. Yeah, I haven't, it's on my list, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's a really, really, really interesting film. Michael um, Shannon playing a um, confused and aggressive man. Yeah, who, well, who, yeah, yeah, oh, sort of. But overall, you think maybe 
in in the future when people are writing movies, they should forego the prepper character in favor of an averagely character. Well, no, that's I, I find it hard to understand how you've drawn that conclusion from what I've been saying. Well, I guess the point is, fine, have a have a stock of five thousand cans of tuna. Right, but, but when the shit when the shit hits the fan, you need to be able to eat berries, really. Yeah. Okay, so that's your your point, really. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I yeah, I I can see that. Um, I think with any of these sort of post-apocalypse films, the thought that always crosses my mind is how ill-prepared I, I would be. Yeah. Uh, in any sort of situation like that. Yeah. You're Just the opposite of a prepper. No. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. I'm an unpreparer. Yeah. <laughs> do you, Do you think that because you don't want to be seen as a prepper, there's a risk that you'll deliberately make yourself unprepared okay so do you think that, yeah so you're saying there's a prepper stigma because yeah. if i said to you i've got like a, a loft full of like 500 bottles of clean drinking water and tins of beans and tuna and mm. um and seeds you'd say you've lost it no i'd say put it in your um garden bunker instead of <laughs> in your loft <laughs> it's not yeah. going to do you any good up there well if if, if a bomb went off it, a dirty bomb. I wouldn't be able to get to my bunker, would I? No, it would be obliterated. Anyway, the, out- <laughs> <laughs> the Outback is an underrated spot for survival, do you think? Uh, I think it's certainly an underrated spot for shooting a film. Yes. Um, because it's very spectacular. But yes, I agree. Um, although one thing that I noticed they didn't really address was uh, how Martin Freeman, a pasty white you know averagely mm. fit uh english man is walking around in what i presume is 30 degree plus heat mm. uh, no tan no no sunburn yeah and carrying a huge amount of stuff on his back yeah without just succumbing to it after about 15 minutes yeah it hasn't put that baby in a hat either no, that's true um yeah although she is part australian mate so uh if that makes a difference <laughs> underrated spot for survival though because they were doing quite well do you think those aborigines in the in the little crater yeah although that's that's like an oasis isn't it it's yeah. not really like representative of the Australian outback it's quite good though yeah yeah. It's anywhere right. you'd like to think you could do better um yeah uh what about a sea fort you know like one of those mm. freestanding they look a bit like oil rigs yeah I know um, what you, mean, yeah. you could fish off the side catch rainwater you've got shelter mm-hmm. it's going to be difficult for any infected people to get to you any people at all really yeah um and you should be able to weather any sort of storm that's true uh you can you fish no there you go then another unprepared yeah but trace. i can't i can't hunt in the australian outback either that's true um um, I did what, think the tundra, but of course you're there, you're at risk of the thing. Yeah, that is very true. What Space. about a boat? You know, like a, a sailboat of well, some kind. Well, there you're at risk of hitting an iceberg or <laughs> the, the events of Triangle. Yeah, capsizing as well, yeah. maybe. Uh, your own house. Okay. Paranormal activity would get you, wouldn't it? Yeah, that, that is unfortunate. A um, supermarket. 28 days later would get you, wouldn't it? Or yeah. Or Dawn of the Dead. Uh, what about on an island? The island would get you. The island. The what? The Michael Bay. Ian McGregor movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the film would get you. Yeah. Shore. No, not on the shore. On the island. Great. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, Keep that in. A satellite. Uh, I can I can see an issue with the satellite idea. Yeah. Life. Yeah. I think you'd eventually run out of food and then be in quite a You'd be more... Dire more, straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Frying pan fire, isn't it, really? Mm. Yeah. So, Chris, we'd like to be prepared in understanding what we need to deal with. Yeah, but survival preppers, you might say. Yeah. But what do we know mm. about the disease and its effects on the people around it? It seems to have a sort of 48-hour max ticking clock yeah. that gets started as soon as you're bitten or mm-hmm. infected. It's not made entirely clear, which I appreciated as well, by the way, uh, whether it's a sort of parasite, a virus, or a sort of fungal infection. Mm-hmm. It's not, not completely apparent. Uh, as we said, you end up with a sort of covering of pus over any wounds, yeah. over your eyes, over your mouth. 
Um, and you can transmit your infection through bites, which means that, uh, you know, any, any infected um, pose a risk to you. Yeah. Bites and claws, I think, as well. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So certainly bites. It, it seems to be the pus, basically, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, they don't appear to be dead, do they? I think they're just infected. Yeah. Right? Like, it, there's no sort of rotting flesh no. or, you know... And they hibernate, which we wouldn't do if you were dead. Yeah. Is that a sort of, like, cocoon thing, I wondered? Mm. Yeah. Not clear. Mm. You don't see anyone in one. So. No. Uh, or, like, a sort of incubation type situation maybe it's hard to say so chris mm. how are you feeling uh i feel like i've sweat about three quarters of my body weight off yeah anyone listening to this on a day that isn't today won't believe it is as hot as it is it's yeah. honestly insane it's ridiculous and we're inside and the room in which we record uh for lack of other options has windows all the way down one wall yeah uh where the sun comes in for the last, I'd say, six hours of the day. Yeah. So it is basically as hot as... It, like, if you had to build a room to capture heat and sunlight on a day like this... Yeah. This would be, you know... This would be it, yeah. This would be it. And no windows open because we don't want the outside ambience and no fans on because we don't want to spoil the audio that way. Yeah. So with that in mind, <laughs> <laughs> how would you survive mm -hmm. if you found yourself in cargo shorts oh, imagine the the because you want said, leather today yeah exactly that was my first mistake um like us joe um Kay should quit while she's ahead yeah uh, and not go back to the boat just to look for a razor to make her husband shave his beard because she doesn't like it i don't think that's the, uh, precisely why she goes back i think it's just like to find him something nice. Well, that's quit, what she gets. Quit while you're ahead, mate. Yeah, she the the nice present on their anniversary that she finds for him is her death. Her death, his death, and neither of them will see their daughter grow. Happy anniversary. Yeah, I don't know if it was an anniversary. I wrote that in the in the recap. I no, it is. Like it is. Yeah. He says he says that when he gives her the um, gives her the wine. The worst anniversary any of them. If it had. Uh, yeah, quit while you're ahead. You've got enough food for three months. You don't need to risk uh, your lives by trying to get more stuff. No. Like what could be there that's worth risking in your life yeah, on? that he missed. Yeah. It's not even like there's another boat that they come across and she's like, oh, well, he's... You did the last one. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this, this one. one. He's in bed, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What she decided to do in that situation was row herself across a river, mm. which could be boarded from the other side by, you know, anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, leave her infant daughter awake in a room where her husband is asleep. Yeah. Which is already risky. Mm -hmm. No one looking after the baby. And uh, she also let herself get bitten on the arse by a monster, didn't yeah. she? Yeah, she did, yeah. Yeah. Basically, they had enough food. They, they were... The early period of the film is um, there's a dramatic tension because they don't have enough food. Mm. Mm. That is solved five minutes later by Andy finding three months worth of food. Yep. Just that's fine. Three months, great. She should be celebrating like she's won the lottery. Yeah. Not going like, well, maybe, maybe there's something else we might need. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. And like, if you need to, in three months' time, you can run the risk of going on a boat and looking for a yeah. razor or an anniversary gift, right? He's not gonna, like, he's not gonna miss an anniversary gift from you. He's not gonna be like, mm, I'm yeah. a bit disappointed that he, you didn't get he me a didn't card go and or get that because he was worried that she'd like not be happy on the yeah. anniversary. He did yeah. that because it was a life a and funny death situation. Joke. Yeah, yeah. Like he 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 was able to find a moment of levity. Yeah, and otherwise. Difficult situation. Yeah. Do you know what doesn't bring you levity, Joe? Dying and infecting your husband. Yeah. That's the way. That's the way of cargo. How about you? Any ideas? Yeah. Just a quick one. Tell the truth about the boat. He goes on there. He sees something moving. Hears something breathing, maybe. It worries him. 
He then comes back and says, don't worry. There's absolutely nothing to worry about over there. Now I'm going to go somewhere for a little while and leave you next to Pandora's box. Yeah. If he'd gone, oh no, I think there was something aboard there, but I didn't open the door. Yeah, that's true. He doesn't want to worry her. Yeah. And what that means is that she doesn't worry about anything. Yep. And then dies. And then dies. Mission accomplished, Andy. Yeah. yeah. Well I, done. I, I thought maybe he was a bit worried that she might reprimand him for taking a risk. Yeah, that's true. Um, but you'd assume that the fear of being reprimanded outweighed your fear of your wife dying of the plague. Yeah. So you say, you know what? I think there was something on there. Yeah. I got out all right with three months worth of food. Yeah. Let's just stay I, here. It was a stupid thing for me to go in there alone. Yeah. I won't do it again. Yeah. Because it freaked me out. And she would say, oh, that's, you know, you you're, were wrong to do that. Yeah, you're an idiot. Yeah. Don't do that again. What's but, she going to do? Divorce him? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the only other thought I've got mm. is um, for Andy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just to stick to your morals. Okay. It's a um, classic one that we always we always like to bring up on How to Survive. Yeah. So he goes out driving with Vic. And Vic's yeah. like, oh, just start shooting these zombies in the head. Mm-hmm. And he's like, um, okay. And then he starts shooting. He's, maybe he doesn't kill any. Um, is I can't remember. He's he's a bad shot, isn't he? Poor yeah. shot. Right. But we, or what I'd say in that situation is, I don't want to do that. Mm. Thank you, though. I, I'd fine do it, but I'm yeah. not going to. I'm a vegan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like if, I, if I was taking you on a safari and the safari guy was like, here's a gun, just start shooting the animals, I'd say, yeah. I don't want to do that. No. Thank you, Vic. No. And these are people they're killing. Yeah. So. Uh, or just shoot Vic in the head. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Then he um, tell his wife, oh, he had a hunting accident. Yeah. You shouldn't play with guns. Yeah. Um, do you want to marry me instead? <laughs> She, she, for the next yeah. 30 hours yeah oh because he's been bitten yeah I guess he's not really thinking um, marriage at that point no not really not his thinking long term just died that morning he's thinking of flings he's uh, trying to yeah 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 well he, maybe if he got her pregnant that would be some way of surviving so he, he, maybe he should try to seduce her do you think it would pass her. on though yeah no don't know well fluids carry it don't they maybe, yeah I don't know what is coming out of the end of his knob. If it's more of that same stuff. Nasty, eh? The Nasty sap. Thought. Yeah, the sap. <laughs> and on that thought, <laughs> what a lovely note on which to end. Yes. Speaking of sap, you enjoyed it, Chris? Yeah. It was great. Did you have the sap? Yeah. yeah, I got that. Thanks. Cheers. It, it may be hot, but... but it's did. not that hot. Yeah. Has it sapped your energy, do you think? The heat. The movie. Uh... Yeah, the fine. Let's just wrap it up before I actually die. The thought that next week we're covering the 2012 film Sinister. Yeah, recommended by Tim. Thanks, Tim. Uh, if you want to recommend a film to us for us to cover, how to survive show at gmail.com or at how to survive pod on Twitter. Sinister is a sort of like you know, mysterious, um sort of meta found footage film yeah it's not a found footage film but a character finds footage in the film yes uh ethan hawk yeah uh, we've seen it in the cinema many years ago it's, yeah uh, about about like, seven, six years ago yeah, like yeah 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 whenever it came out yes um looking forward to pitching our wits against bagul <laughs> <laughs> i called them bagel or bagel yeah <laughs> bagel yeah uh, sounds like a pussycat <laughs> yeah Bagel. Uh, an email here, Chris, comes from Damien. Mm-hmm. Hi, lads. Found your podcast on YouTube a month ago. So that's good. Cheers, yep. Damien. We're on, we're on YouTube. We've got some videos on there. Yeah. And some audio versions of this very podcast. Yep. New video soon. Keep mm. watching the skies. Um, now he says, I assume you have a backlog of recommendations to get through, but hopefully at some point you could give Death Watch a go. Okay. It's, setting is quite unique for a horror film, mm-hmm. but it's one where I liked the idea more than the finished product. Do you well, know what the setting is? What is the setting? It is the World War One trenches. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Is uh, is there found footage in that movie? Uh, no found footage. No. That's um, a shame. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks for that one on the list, Damien. It it goes on the list. 
Daniel has also been in touch, who wants to do this Scream franchise. Other Scream movies. Tried looking for Scream and Scream 2. Uh, we've done Scream 2, and I think we talked about Scream 1 quite a lot in that, so that's yeah. why we didn't do Scream 1. Yeah. Uh, we are currently accepting suggestions for the next franchise we're going to cover, starting with episode 160. So get your ideas in. Yeah. Scream will be noted down as one yes, of those. thank you. Um, I feel like it needs to be longer to... to is there, any, is it, there are five Scream movies. Yeah, but I feel like there needs to be sort of enough of them to sort of see the huge diving yeah. quality that we used to uh, enjoying. Yeah. Well, I guess Friday the 13th had no quality to begin with, so it was yeah. harder to track that decline. Yeah, I suppose Paranormal so. Paranormal Activity's decline was more or less instantaneous. Yeah. As soon as the credits rolled on the first film, it never really got up, um, up again. No. So we'll have to see what happens next. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for those emails. The email address, once again, is howtosurviveshow at gmail.com. The Twitter handle is at howtosurvivepod. Make sure you get in touch. And while you're at it, why not leave us a five-star review on iTunes as it really helps us find new listeners. Yeah. And who knows, one of them might be our big break. <laughs> yes. Subscribe as well, though, because it means you get yeah. the you get us creeping into your ears while you sleep. I think that's how it works. What a t- weird and sinister way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. how it's like you thought to yourself, how what is the most unpleasant way yeah. of uh, putting this sentiment? That's how I wrote the joke. Yeah, yeah, good. Wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yes. And here's my next one. Uh, we stand next to your bed at night, like the uh, woman in Paranormal Activity One. Great. We don't really. Yeah. Because. The heat's getting to you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> tapping out. Boiling your brain. Oh, Thanks very much. So hot. <laughs> is, it, is it getting hotter? That's I it. think so, yeah. It might be the embarrassment, though. Oh, it might be. Thanks very much for listening. Hopefully we'll be back next week if we survive the heat wave. Godspeed to all of you. Goodbye. <laughs>